what I'm going to really focus is the clinical sort of a presentation of the cell and how we manage it. And also okay, how pay, what parents should do to manage it and what other frontline professionals should do and there are some things they should do and the things they shouldn't be doing it. Uh, it's a very emotive subject because once the virus adolescent self-harm, it led, raises a lot of painful emotions, not only in the child, but also in the parents, in the siblings, in the neighbors, in the school, standard family members, politicians, everybody else, and even in our team members. And I think self-harm is one of the most important <coughs> symptoms when children and adolescents can't express their inner emotional pain and distress, they were self-harm and should be taken seriously. So in our team, if anybody is self-harming, we think should have a comprehensive camp assessment because it might indicate minor distress and it might indicate serious distress. So it's a way of communication and way to communicate with children and adolescents is not easy. Because in languages use different ways, you know, a six years old, seven years old, ten years old, fifteen years old, eighteen years old will have different preoccupations, different languages they will use, different behavior they will have. So you need to know okay, how a five what, what are the what are the sort of preoccupations of five years old. Before we start any intervention or any assessment, you need to have some sort of rapport or some therapeutic relationship with these children. And you might be able to establish this within few minutes, it's not a difficult thing to do. If you can't establish a rapport, the adolescents are not going to open up to you and they not tell you to what they are suffering from. A simple example is that if an adolescent comes to me with some, in my outpatient clinic with some pain, and a lot of other social problems and involvement with police and drug and drink abuse, I always ask parents to come and mostly mothers will who are distressed will say, you know, it's so bad. He's involved with police, he has been expelled from school, he's taking cannabis, he's cutting himself, he's doing all sorts of things, blah, blah, blah. I usually sit facing the child and ask parents to I just sit facing the child. I might open up with one question. I said, Mrs. Johnson, tell me what's good about you. The one that's say 15 years old. What's good about your son? This is my opening question. Mother is getting a bit confused. We are coming with all sorts of problems. The background is asking. That is good about our son. But this 15 years old is very, very interested in me. And everybody has told me I am so bad, social services police. That Raman is asking what's good about me. So this opening question, I have established a link with him. Basically, I confronted him with John, what is good about you? And this question is going to bug him. When he's going to go out of the interview room, this question will come back to him. So this question will bug him and that is also a therapeutic process at the start. Because I am forced to think him in a different way, you are not bad, what is good about you? And mother is also going to think, was asking what is good about my son. Is there anything good about my son? Because most of the parents forget about good things about their, uh, about their children. Some mother will say, you are not a grandma, there is nothing good about him, he is an evil child. So once, once she has said that, the adolescent head is going to go down, but I am not going to buy it. I said, Mrs. Johnson, I cannot agree with you. There must be something good about you. So this person is again interested. The lift is answered. So Kramat is again on to what's good about me. He doesn't agree with my mother. And again, basically, this is my linking with him. This is establishing some sort of link with him. I'm telling him, you know, I'm interested in your goodness, not in bad behavior. And wants to make things difficult. I say, Mom, you say he's an evil child. Who has given him evil genes? <laughs> if you are the one of them. 50% genes is carried from father, 50% genes is carried from mother. <laughs> <laughs> so this boy is again interested. That's not what he's like. He's just sorting out my parents. <laughs> if, if, if mother says, on the, I can't remember anything, I will give the homework to her. I said, I might relieve him, say, Mom, you have lost control over your son. So it's the bad behavior has been leave him to loss of control. And he wants you to go and think what you can do to get the control back. 
this is your homework. Go and think for about four weeks. If you remember anything, put on your diary and bring it back. So now, my mother is not going to go back. Believing that Abraham is going to ask me, what can I do to get control over my son? And he and she used to write. So this is what really therapeutic process is. But this boy, I even asked me, reframe him, saying, you know, John, I understand that you are doing your work, and it seems to me that you have lost control over yourself. This is a bad behavior, it is reframed into loss of control. He said, yes, Dr. Ramad, I think you are right. My question is, what you are going to do to get the control back? So I don't know. So okay, this is the homework for you. You need to go and think what you can do to get the control back. So it's a therapeutic process that started in the first two minutes. So that's how you try to establish some sort of a link with the child, not to focus on the bad behavior, but trying to focus on the, the strengths. Well, to my surprise, you, you give highest rates of self harm here. We are leading the way. 400 episodes per 100,000 population. 15 to 60 years old, so 10% of girls and more than 3% boys have self harm in the previous year. It is becoming basically a growing problem as a public health problem. Suicide is the second most important cause of death in adolescence. Only road traffic accidents and accidents kill more children and adolescents. So, so after that is the second most important in health children. Obviously there's a lot of stigma. And deliberate self-harm, cutting, overdosing is strongest predictor of completed suicide. So it should be taken seriously. There's no other symptom which is indicates a high risk. Majority of the self-harm did not attend the hospital. So we only see the tip of the iceberg. Most of the self harm occurs in community. 50% of them, nobody knows it is done in secrecy. If they cut their hands, they give long shirts, even don't tell their parents. So it's, 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 we see only the tip of the iceberg. 